Hello, hello. We are live for the uh, the festive resource performance cost, all that good optimization stuff here. I'm here with Reed from Stormforge, and we are going to dive into everything performance optimization, resource optimization, cost optimization, and ultimately just talk about it from an engineering perspective, not necessarily showcasing uh, products or tools or anything other than standard Kubernetes practices that we can utilize. Uh, but we're just going to have a conversation, uh, engineering focused, practitioner led, getting you ready for production, everything and anything around performance optimization. Reed, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, doing well. Um, this is kind of fun. I don't do a lot of this stuff. So Michael was just walking me through like how the platform works and what all the cool whistles and dials are. Uh, yeah, yeah, doing great. Good morning. Yeah, right. no, this because is really you guys cool are all stuff. afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm on the I, West am, Coast. I am. It's very early for me. <laughs> yeah, I am just getting into my afternoon. It is 12.01 here, which means it is 9.01 for you. Um, I'm still drinking my coffee, though, as I usually am uh, throughout the throughout the day until about 7 p.m. So <laughs> awesome. All right. So resource optimization. Maybe we could do a quick uh, one sentence. You know, what, what what's kind of resource optimization like? What, what is the most important thing from your perspective when it comes to resource optimization? Yeah. Um, first, of course, I want to add a little context setting. I My mind is purely focused on the Kubernetes kind of container um, world. So when I say resource optimization, uh, it's using the resources you need and no more. Yep. Um, yep, exactly. Basically. Yeah. And, and I think that's where it kind of comes into play from an overall performance perspective as well, because you know, like I, I, th I feel like when we when we think about or talk, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but like the the first thing that always comes to mind with resource optimization and cost optimization in my head is like decreasing resources. But I also feel like that's not always the case. Like I feel like a lot of the time when it comes to resource optimization, like if you take too many resources away, you're gonna have way more problems, right? Like it's, in my opinion, it's all about performance performance optimization like what do i need to use to make my application my workloads whatever it is my systems work as good as they should yeah and in kubernetes it's all it's allocation up front so you have to you you get what you ask for in terms of resources but if you haven't asked for enough resources some bad things can happen either you can end up um using kind of invisible resources that you didn't really, that weren't actually allocated to you, it happened to be available, so you're okay for a while. Um, or, you know, worst case, you can end up not having resources that you need, you can end up increasing latency, apps can crash or have performance issues. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, when you say cost optimization, absolutely people think let's, let's cut down on what we're spending money on. Um, but if you actually need the resources that that money was paying for, uh, then that's not, that's not optimization anymore. Right, exactly. Yeah. And <clears throat> I also think that it also comes into bad practices. So I've I've spoken to companies where they wanted to, for example, only run one Kubernetes worker node, you know, overnight when nobody was hitting the application. And although that maybe perhaps sounds like it makes sense to keep costs down, you're now no longer optimizing. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's obviously a bad practice to only run one worker node. Uh, hence, why you know you can't deploy your production level application in Minikube on your on your desktop. Uh, that wouldn't be very good for anybody you utilizing it. Work. You really should. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yes, you you can you can do whatever you want to do in life, uh, but you shouldn't with certain things. <laughs> one being Minikube for production. So, and to your point, I want to just share my screen here really quick. Uh, ba, ba, ba. So this was something that we were kind of discussing a little bit as well. <clears throat> and, and to your point of like, let's make sure we have all of the resources that we need to run our application uh, or our workload or our stack or like whatever it is, right? So mm -hmm. for example... I'm just running a really small AKS cluster right now. It's on uh, Kubernetes version 1.20. It has three worker nodes, but it's like a series A. So it's very, very small. So let's say I, for example, uh, try to do something like this to so just like install Istio. Uh, so let's maybe do 
So I'm going to install the Istio base here just using Elm. <clears throat> and this is just going to go through, install CRDs, all that good mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and then I'm going to install the actual work workload. So this is going to have the pods, any services, yada, yada. <clears throat> so the point is I kind of want to show this, not to show everybody how to install Istio because, you know, but uh, to more or less show what happens when you make your cluster too small because you're trying to do something like a cost optimization in terms of, you know, getting costs super low or whatever. So you want to try to run the bare minimum. And sometimes the bare minimum works to just get the lights on. But then the thing is, you know, you have all your lights on and that's great, but then your bulbs start popping and it's not working <laughs> as expected and it's super dim in your house. And, uh, you know, nobody can see where they're going and they're bumping into walls. And, and that's again, like the, resource versus cost optimization thing of like which one works best in what regard so i just want to do a quick shouldn't have put that weight flag at the end <laughs> <laughs> okay so this is doing whatever it's doing but everything is more, well actually the reason why this is uh still pending here is because the workloads aren't running so <clears throat> yeah, I have this pod wait here. until every pod that it thinks is needs to be ready is comes back, which is not going to happen in this case. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So if we do a quick kubectl scribe pod namespace istio system, notice here how we have a failing of scheduling. Why? Inefficient memory, right? This essentially means that the worker nodes that I have deployed do not have enough memory for Istio to run based on its prerequisite and its requirements. So again, this is a this is a, like an example of Kubernetes is up and running. AKS is good, no failures, worker nodes are up, I can deploy workloads, I can do this, I can do that, etc. But then you come into something like Istio that needs X amount of resources to even run not even talking about running properly, right? Because we haven't even started talking about ge getting our foot in the door versus running things the way they're actually supposed to run. So I'm going to... Oh, sorry, Reed, did yeah. you have something? Oh, I was just going to say there's an interesting potential nuance here. There's not enough resources on that cluster to schedule Istio with the resources that it's specified as needing, which may or may not be actually the same as the resources it really needs, especially yeah. in a small cluster. Yeah, exactly. Um, but Kubernetes doesn't... It, all of those are inputs to the system. And so whatever the Helm chart said it needed, that's what it's going to try and allocate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then on the opposite side of the spectrum there, you could have a minimum of what you need to run. So like, for example, uh, with a, with a Kubernetes worker node, let's say you're deploying uh, via, you're bootstrapping via kubeadm or something like that. The VMs that you're running need the minimum of two gigs of RAM. But do you want to run your your worker nodes with two gigs of RAM? Probably not. Uh, you probably want at least four ish to make it run somewhat decently smooth. So there's also like these bare minimum requirements, but like it's not going to run in the way that you're expecting. So if I just pop open the Azure portal here, uh, let me zoom in a bit. I feel like that's kind of far away. Uh, so I'm going to go into Kubernetes service. I go into my cluster here. I'm going to scroll down to node pools. And then what I'm going to do, like just to kind of showcase this, and it's going to take a couple of minutes to kind of create this. Um, but <clears throat> in terms of, uh, you know, getting it up and running, but if I just mm -hmm. do like test type, I'm sitting crooked right now. So my typing skills aren't as good as they usually are. Uh, I'm going to do like also a choose. A demo, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Anytime somebody's watching, that's when the typing all goes to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, let me just, where are we at? We're at RAM. We'll do a V5. That's good. And then I'll do like max three. I'll do a review and create, create. So this is going to take a little bit just for it to actually, oh, Oh, there we go. Still so, uh, failed invalid template uh, is not valid according to. Oh, that's a weird one. Oh, quota exceeded. Interesting. Mm. Okay. 
Uh, I don't know why I'm, I actually don't know why I'm hitting quota limits right now because that should not be the case. Uh, this does remind me of the last time I gave a live demo at a meetup group and I had intended to be using one Kubernetes cluster, but my cube context was set wrong and I was pointed at a completely <laughs> different cluster. Uh, and I didn't figure it out until after the demo, but you know, good luck on the, on the quota live. Yeah, this is, this is the strangest thing because I just increased my quota. Uh, let me try this one, maybe. Let's see. Minimum. Well, actually, no, we'll do an auto scale three. All right, let's try this one. It could also just be the size that I chose. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see. So while this is doing its thing, uh, essentially while, why we are doing this is because I want to showcase the minimum uh, of, of what's needed to run a Kubernetes cluster versus the minimum of, you know, read to your point, what's specified in, in the Helm chart of what, what should be the minimum uh, count in terms of how much RAM, in terms of how much CPU, et cetera. So what's hopefully going to happen if I don't hit that error again, nope, I'm good actually. It was just the one that I chose. Uh, it didn't work for whatever reason. So this is creating and what it's going to do is it's going to up the memory RAM that's available in my cluster because with all worker nodes, what ends up happening is uh, these worker nodes are looked at as like a pool, right? So you could have three worker nodes or you could have 10 worker nodes, but Kubernetes is looking at them as just a pool of resources. Like it knows how many worker nodes are there, but it almost doesn't care. <clears throat> it cares more about like how much RAM and CPU is available as a whole in the cluster versus how much CPU and RAM is available on this worker node and this one and this one, it's just gonna look at it as a whole. So yeah. what's going or even, to- Or even smaller, it's one of those complex systems where what it's doing is very, very simple. It's not necessarily even aware of, like you said, this idea that there's this many resources in the cluster. What it, all it does is whenever it needs to schedule a single pod, is this gonna say, can I find a node and it's gonna potentially search through every, every single one that has as an individual node that has this block of memory and this, you know, um, allocation of CPU available. That's mm -hmm. it. Um, exactly. Nothing more complicated than that. <laughs> exactly. Nothing complex at all uh, when it comes to Kubernetes. Like most screen. complex systems, that little interaction can potentially, as you get into huge clusters and bigger systems, like there can be, there can be other sort of emergent behaviors or side effects that come from that little piece of logic, but it's not, it's fundamentally simple what it's trying to do. Exactly. Yep. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the goal here is to showcase, all right, we have this minimum, we have this max, maybe we'll hit, you know, uh, 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 limits and stuff like we just kind of saw, but the goal here is once this is actually creating again, when you're creating node pools, it does kind of take a little bit. Um, but the goal is once this is created, we're actually not going to have to do anything from uh, uh, an Istio perspective. Like we don't have to go in, recreate, reconfigure. Ooh, we just, I just saw that came up and running. Uh, we don't have to do anything. We literally just have to give it more memory and then it should be good to go. So let's go ahead and, and <laughs> test that. Yeah, so ahead. when you say give it more memory, what you've done in this case is you've, you've created more nodes on the cluster making basically, the cluster overall has more memory available and specifically there's some nodes um, that should now have enough memory individually to, to schedule one or more of the Istio pods. Exactly. Yes. So if I go ahead now, notice we had that error there before, but if I go ahead and run this again, right now we see everything is up and running and, and I didn't do anything, right? All I did was add more worker nodes, which gave the overall cluster more memory and CPU to use. And based on the the minimum requirement uh, of Istio, it said, okay, I need more memory. We gave more worker nodes. Those worker nodes had more memory. That though, that memory went into the pool of resources available in the worker nodes. And then Istio saw the new worker nodes come up and say, oh, okay, cool. I have more memory. Now I can utilize it. My pod can come up and everything's gravy. Mike, just to give me some context, because I haven't seen this before, what, what, how much memory was that pod you were looking at requesting? Like, how big a workload was that? That is a good question. <clears throat> Let's see if we can see that in the describe. Should be there. 
Yes. We can see that it was inefficient memory here, and then we can see that it came up uh, successfully. Yeah. After Somewhere up it. above in the spec definition, it should have what it's actually requested. Let's uh, see. If we can't find it here, we should probably just be able to open up the there, home There it is, though. The right request right there. So it's it's asking for two okay. gigs of memory all by itself, uh, this, this workload. Right. W which is interesting because it's not... Chances are, like in, like right now, right? It's not using two gigs, um, mm -hmm. but that's just more or less like the request, and and that brings us to what requests are, what quotas are, what limits are, etc. Which is like the bare minimum, like what the workload needs to run. Um, and we we actually have an example here. If I open this up, so you know, requests based on a resource quota, for example. So maybe this is a good. Uh, segmentation into what requests are, what quotas are, what limits are. Yeah, um, and I uh, I might actually segue a little bit into a um, kind of a visual demo of part of that in a second. But fundamentally, um, quotas are kind of on top of everything else. So I want to start down lower. Mm -hmm. um, requests are how we just saw that Kubernetes. We tried to deploy Istio. Um, Kubernetes couldn't do it. There wasn't space for it. And so we had to add more nodes. Well, how did it know there wasn't space? That's what requests are. Whenever you try and run a pod, um, the Kubernetes scheduler is going to say, well, where can I put this? If there are no requests at all, that means Kubernetes has no idea how many resources that pod needs. Um, it'll put it almost anywhere. Uh, and how, how well that goes is a whole separate question. <laughs> Um, but if there's if there's a request size, that's a hint to the scheduler of you shouldn't put this on any node unless it has this amount of memory sort of not yet allocated or or assigned reserved for another workload. Um, mm -hmm. That is an input to the system because the scheduler, this workload isn't running. We can't see how much memory it would use. This is a pre hint like somebody had to write this down or some system had to inject this and say to the scheduler like that's what you're looking for in order to run this process. Um, mm -hmm. That's requests. Um, there's some cool side effects with requests, like because of how they're implemented um, in terms of the uh, Linux C groups underneath under the hood. Um, sometimes those request settings can be translated into actual like real reservations, like you're guaranteed to get a certain amount of CPU time if you requested it for a workload. Right. Um, not so much a guarantee with memory. Well, <laughs> if, we, if we care, we can get into that, but <laughs> memory is a little little dicier. Yeah, um, that's request. It's what do I, what do I, what do I, what do I say I need? I emphasize right. the say because there's no evidence to suggest it's it's what you actually need yet. That's what, what's what you asked for. Exactly. And I think like, and, and we're going to go into limits, requests, uh, quotas, et cetera. But I think that's, I, I almost prefer to use request. Now, by the way, we're talking about how to do this manually. On Tuesday, we're going to talk about how to not do this manually, uh, and we're going to go through that whole thing. But um, my opinion, Reed's opinion, is this is very low hanging fruit, and you shouldn't be doing all this manually, anyways. But still, need to, you should still learn what's underneath the hood and how it all works. Um, but we'll get into that Thursday. Just like but, calculus in college, exactly. Who still, still does that manually? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but when it comes to requests, like that's. And I'm curious your opinion here, but that is why I like using requests more than limits because you're kind of setting this definition of like, this is what I need or this is what I am expecting, mm -hmm. right? Versus a limit is like, that's it. It's what you got. Well, a request, a request is, is here's what I'm expecting. A limit was basically, and if I'm wrong, here, <laughs> exactly. here's how I'm going to, here's how I'm going to like, uh, uh, the saving grace of, yeah, I told you I needed, you know, I told you I could have two beers or whatever, but that was wrong. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but there's a hard cap of. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, why I like the idea of requests because it's, it's almost like, well, it is not almost, it is you setting like this minimum requirement. Uh, this is what I believe my workflow needs. Uh, mm -hmm. Will it use all of it? I don't know. Maybe. And again, this is why we're going to talk about why we shouldn't be doing this manually to begin with. But maybe we know what we need. Chances are we usually don't know exactly the number. And once we finally do figure out the number, it changes anyways. Uh, so that, 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 minimum, that minimum requirement. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play devil's advocate, though, and, and argue with myself as I do daily. 
<laughs> when I set when I set requests, we just saw what happens, right? So like Istio has this particular request of two gigs of memory, but me just deploying Istio as a Helm chart is not utilizing two gigs of memory. So I am requesting what I may or may not need, which again goes back to this, like when we're setting limits, when we're setting requests, these are merely guesses. And I don't know, like, I guess I'll, uh, I'm curious on your thoughts. Like I, cause I'm arguing with myself here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I do like requests based on here's my minimum that I believe that I need, but then it's almost like we, again, we just saw with Istio, like it would have ran just fine without two gigs. Like it didn't mm -hmm. need it yet to get it deployed. It didn't need it to start to it didn't need in this moment. It probably never would have needed it on this small cluster. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So then it's like, you know, I mean, in, in, in your opinion, and we can go into limits and stuff like, what are your thoughts on requests? Like, do you think that it's the most, again, when we're doing yeah. it manually like this, is it the most beneficial way? So it's tricky. Um, if I start with an idealized world, if requests are always accurate and request and, and correct for what a workload needs, um, limits are not nearly as important because that's the correct requests are going to give you the best balance of performance optimization where every workload has what it needs and that, that, that resource is reserved or available for it to use, but also cost optimization because you know, the, the best way to get the highest performance for a workload, I guess, or an easy way is uh, give it the whole node. Um, don't have it fight with anything else. Um, make the node really big. Guess what? Performance is probably going to be great. Of course, that means it's not cost optimal. <laughs> um, and so if, if, we, if we let requests be accurate, um, limits aren't that important. If everything is requesting as much CPU, you know, as many CPU cycles or percentage of CPU time as it needs, um, we're not going to be fighting for contention. If everything has the right amount of memory requested, one process over consume, well, hopefully no process is going to over consume, but like any process memory spiking is not going to cause an oom kill event that ends up killing its neighbors or itself. Mm -hmm. um, if requests are right. So that's, that's why start, if you start with requests and requests are right, limits become much less important. Where limits come in is when requests are wrong or something goes wrong in the process. So if a process requested 100 millicore of CPU, but it turns out that it's churning through almost a full core by itself, um, how that, that's kind of turned into a noisy neighbor or a bad neighbor problem because it's not the only workload running on the node, but it's asking for 10 times as much CPU as it, or it's trying to use 10 times as much CPU as was requested. So this, this node has now become over-provisioned mm -hmm. um, with workloads. Uh, if there was a limit in place, that can be basically a, a, a hedging your bet basically on the request and saying, yeah, I requested 100 millicore, but, I'm but I want to be a good neighbor. I'm never going to let this thing over-consume beyond, I don't know, 500 millicore as a limit. Um, that's just kind of protecting the workload from a mistake that was made in the request, perhaps. Um, right. There's other, there's other uses for it too, like spiky workloads that you don't need to burst that high, but um, fundamentally limits, I, I often see limits as uh, they come, they, they literally come after requests, like they have to be higher than or equal to requests. Mm. Uh, and I see them as the backstop. They're the safety for when requests weren't working or weren't quite right. Yeah. And, and I think that, yeah. And, and, and I mean, and again, like we're going to go into this on Thursday, but that's kind of the reason why we shouldn't be doing this manually uh, to begin with as a whole, because you, you, you don't know, like you, you can have a solid guess of what your requests are, what your limits are, but you don't know. And that's catastrophic, right? So like when we set a limit, for example, and let's say the, the workflow goes over that limit or attempts to, what happens? system appendix save, yeah. right? Like your workload is just not running. And then it's like, well, what do you like? Are you then like, I mean, obviously you're setting up monitoring, you're setting up observability, maybe you're setting up automated workflows to increase the CPU limit or, or well, actually not limit, uh, which we should talk about the whole CPU limit works request thing because mm -hmm. you and I had a good conversation around that. But uh, the, the specific request around the CPU, there was the, there was, um, expected limits uh in the memory and then you set that and it's like okay you create some automation to maybe up that or decrease it or whatever based on your observability practices but overall chances are somebody's either going to be sitting there looking at what happened at nine in the morning or they're going to be waking up at two in the morning with an alert 
Yeah, and let me let me kind of dive into that a little bit too, because we started by saying like, yeah, it'd be great. Like, this is something that ideally um, we wouldn't have to do, but we people can do this. You can understand what the right requests are for a given workload and right limits are. It's a pretty it's a pretty simple workflow for one workload, and it starts with observability, like you were kind of getting into. Um, if you are, and let me briefly um, just toss this on the screen so there's a, a visual to go with it. If you have any kind of monitoring or observability going on, you can look at your workloads and you can see. So this, by the way, this is three very simple workloads. Um, this is a graph of CPU consumption for each one of them. Uh, they are all consuming exactly, I think, 100 millicore. No, 400 millicore. It looks like um, just consistently. This is just like a this is a built-in Kubernetes project tool called Resource Consumer. Guess what it does? It consumes how much re how many resources you told it to. Um, and if I were, if I'm able to pull this information up for any workload on my system. Very few of them are going to be this easy to read. Um, you can get a sense of, yeah, this is what it's using. And therefore, ideally, the requests for each of these workloads, if this was truly its profile, would be 400 millicore. Give me right. 400 millicore, please, for each of these workloads. So you can do the work. You can like pull it up. You can watch it over time. It gets more. This is such a this is such a simple example. It's almost painful because no real life <laughs> workload is ever going to look like this. Um, but uh, you can do it. I want to just emphasize, it's not a matter of not being able to. It's just one of those things that um, for most, the first question, who's going to do that? Um, it's one of, one of kind of two groups that we typically see, either the developer who owns the application, who's working on it. Um, they went in, they defined the resource, their deployment up front, they set the requests. They might be able to go look at these, uh, look at their observability platform and figure out, you know, how well did they do? They requested 500 millicore. Is that right? Do they need to go lower to save costs or go higher? Because it uses more. Um, it could be the developer. That's not a great use of most people's time, they would argue. That's not what they signed up to do. It's not going to be, you know, anytime they, anytime they spend kind of tuning their request for one set of workloads is time they're not working on whatever the next set of features is for the business. Um, right. And if it's not them, then it's somebody who doesn't know their application. And at that point, it's with this, the platform team, perhaps. But whoever, if you don't know the application, it's, it's harder for you to do that request setting appropriately. Yeah. No, totally, one hundred percent. And yeah. to so your not point, that you should do it. I just wanted to say it can be done. <laughs> just like we were talking, I think did we say yeah. this live? You you can run a production workload on a mini cube single node on your laptop. You just probably shouldn't. But you <laughs> yep, that's 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 uh, that's a beautiful thing about life is there there are a lot of things that we can do, but perhaps we shouldn't do them. Uh, to everybody's <laughs> discretion, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But the it, to your point, like you can you can set up proper observability practices to showcase and see what memory uh, utilization, what CPU utilization, what you're going to need. But then here's the problem. It's going to change, right? You know, and, and, and this is, you know, I, I love the forecasting where it's like, this is what Q1 looked like last year. So mm -hmm. we should optimize for the same thing as last year. And the, and then there are two things that could either be great and it may work, but then the question is, well, if it did work, that means that your business or your whatever didn't increase in velocity and therefore should it be working? Probably not. And maybe you have uh, other concerns with the business, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can kind of get this idea of like where things are supposed to look and be. But then the question is like, do you want to do that? Should you, et cetera. Uh, and what, yeah, and and then we kind of get into this conversation of like CPU, right? So we we talked a lot about memory, and we showcased uh, the, these memory examples of you know what happened with Istio and stuff like that. And then we get into CPU, and <clears throat> there is a there's a lot of you know uh, there's a lot of conversation, and there's a lot of information out there around why we shouldn't be setting CPU limits. Uh, robusta.dev they have a lot of awesome uh, content around this and reed and i had this conversation because i created some content and how i how i phrased it you know after reed and i looked at it it wasn't it wasn't entirely accurate in terms of like how i was saying it so then reed and i went back and forth and reed came up with a great definition of you know ultimately what this what this means in terms of cpu limits and why it's not good uh so reed if it's okay if i put you on the spot i'll ask you your opinion on you know what why shouldn't we be setting limits on cpu 
Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me do this, actually, since you put me on the spot. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reshare that thing I just had up, if I can figure out where that button was. Because um, I can just talk, but it, I, I, should, I should be able to actually show a little, little bit of just the behavior that you mentioned that kind of the Robusta um, blog kind of really went into detail on. Um, but this should, I think, I think I can do this. Um, I'm going to share one screen. I'm, I might switch to a terminal a little later to kind of show behind the scenes what's going on, but you should be able to see just this graph again. This is, by the way, this is not, this is not fancy. I have to press the execute button to get it to requery. It does not move by itself. Um, but let me, let me, I'm going to throw some, first off, let me explain what's going on with these workloads a little bit. Um, the red workload uh, is a workload that has CPU requests and limits set. I think it's 400 millicore requests and probably a gig or one CPU um, limit. Um, there's another workload with no request set at all, which is going to be the, I think it's the blue one right here. Um, no requests, no limits. And there's a workload that has requests and no limits. I'm going to toss additional load. Um, so this, this, by the way, this is, these are all running on a single two core system. So our ceiling, our maximum CPU utilization is about two cores. We're idling at around, just under 1.4 right now. What happens if I throw a bunch of work at one of these workloads? I'm going to start by throwing it at, um, if I could share two screens, I'd probably do that. But this is just some basic terminal work. I'm, I'm just throwing workload at some of these things. This is going to set the no limits uh, workload so it, to try and consume up to two CPU cores at once. Um, and I'm actually showing a couple of things right now, but you can see that it does top out just under two full cores, um, during this time period, that green one, it turns out is the workload that has no limits applied to it. Um, that's fine. The thing I want to or really show though is, so the argument was like limits on CPU are complicated and you probably don't need to set them if requests are set pro properly. And here's the kind of the demonstration. This will last for 30 seconds and go back to zero or back to four millicore. The green workload is trying to consume two. Um, it's not actually getting there. Uh, there doesn't have a limit. There are no limits on that workload, but it is capping out at just under 1.5. And the reason it's doing that is uh, there, the other workload on here, the red one, has requests set. Having proper requests, uh, turns out in the implementation, there are some caveats, big asterisk. But generally speaking, uh, if you have proper requests set, any workload with requests is guaranteed to get the CPU access that it asked for. And so anything above and beyond what's been allocated and requested should be considered fair game. And if you don't have limits set, that means any workload that briefly needs it will be permitted to burst into that unallocated space. Okay. Um, critically, only the unallocated. If something that did ask for it needs it, that is not burstable. The other workload is not going to be able to interfere. Um, in this demo, that light, the workload in the middle, that didn't have any requests. Uh, it's more complicated than the question called for. Um, that's why it got kind of squeezed out there at the end. Um, mm -hmm. But the workload that had requests kept them, and the workload that was asked to overconsume didn't burst into or consume that reserved kind of protected space. It didn't need a limit to do that. That behavior is intrinsic to what, the way the, the C limit C groups are set up. Got it. Interesting. Okay. So, hmm. Uh, in this example, I did have a workload with no requests set, yeah. and that one did get screwed over. Um, you can see right. that during the period of overconsumption by the green workload, uh, it got completely squeezed out. Um, yeah, and that's what I was just kind of uh, visualizing and going through in my head when I was umming and ahhing is mm -hmm. that then brings us to a fundamental problem here of setting requests and limits manually. If you have one or two workloads, pretty straightforward, right? Like if you have, you know, one application stack that it has maybe one deployment and then you have another one that has like, you know, one, one stateful set or something you can manually set those man uh, you can set those deployment specs you can set all of those things within your kubernetes manifest for setting the cpu for setting um the memory etc and that's pretty straightforward like I don't, I don't like if your workload is that small uh which 
I can pretty much guarantee like 90% of the time it's not going to be right. 90 to 95%, mm-hmm. you know, organizations are going to have far more than two Kubernetes manifests. Uh, and then if you only have two Kubernetes manifests, my, my question may be like, you should probably just, your my statement should probably be, you should use ECS or something instead, uh, make your life easier. But if you have multiple workloads that you have to manage from that perspective to your point and what you just showed was one workload, one stack may get the the tail end of it all and not have the proper resources that it actually needs to run the workflows. So yeah. it, then it's like, th- then you kind of have to question and ask yourself like, what is your overall QA process to this? Right. Because that, that kind of falls into this quality assurance practice of like, is everything set the way it's supposed to? Are your limits set? Are your requests set? Do you have particular quotas in place for everything? And if not, mm-hmm. like what's your QA process of figuring out how things should be? You know, like yeah. are, are you looking at this once a week? Are you looking at this every couple of days? Who's looking at it? Like who's responsible to look at all these manifests and be like, are these limits and requests and quotas set as they should be? Yeah, and to kind of kind of dig into like just paraphrase that a little bit and emphasize sort of what's important about this. Um, if we accept, we can do more demos, but if we accept that getting requests set correctly for each workload in each environment, and ideally deciding on a policy for how limits, because the limits come after requests, how limits should be configured. If we accept that uh, when there's those are not done properly, bad, some interestingly bad things can happen. We showed one example where a workload that didn't have requests at all got squeezed out that would have been effectively 100% latency right. if it was a web workload. Um, if we accept that we need proper ones, how does an organization um, set up uh, a policy uh, or workflow or pr- procedure process, what have you? How, do, how does an organization put in, put in place uh, a means of ensuring that this stuff is most, kept mostly correct? Because it does change over time. It's not, a, it's not a research at once, set it and forget it sort of thing. Especially if you have you know, a website workload, you deploy it in a development environment, guess how much load that's going to get? The answer is not the same as the real world in most situations. Either it's going to get nothing because it's just a dev environment, or it's going to get a set amount of load based on some kind of performance test that you've built. Um, but that's one environment. And so set, getting it correctly in dev is not necessarily the same as getting the allocation correct for your UAT environment, or getting the allocation correct for your production environment. Or maybe there's some seasonality in the load over periods of days, weeks, or months. And so all of those things are a little bit dynamic. Um, so how does your organization sort of stay on top of that? Like you said, Michael, with a QA process or sort of a, a um, an adjustment tuning true up process for making sure that requests are appropriate. And I emphasized appropriate because we can define what that is all we want. And there's some options. <laughs> and, and you're spot on 100%. I, I didn't, it, it, it wasn't something that we talked about just yet, but that totally makes sense of when we're figuring all of this out, by the way, you have to figure this out three to four times dev staging if you have a qa environment and of course production so now <laughs> so now not only do you have to kind of figure out this process of setting you know requests and limits as a whole but now you have to figure it out for all of these environments yeah i can because, tell you the easy way to you know, do it um pick your largest environment figure yeah. it out there and use those same request settings everywhere else that's the easy way there's a cost yeah, to that. Exactly. Yes. That, that that could be the easy way, but then uh, your CFO or VP of finance or whoever may be knocking at your door and, and asking you what is going on. Uh, so, so there's there's the pro and the con there. And we actually, we have a, a statements last perhaps question that just popped up here that I wanted to show. Uh, I can't show it all at once because there's two different comments, so I can only show one at a time. But uh, it says, but if there's an app which suddenly starts consuming huge amounts of resources, it might impact for performance and stability of other containers on the same node when not setting any limit. Uh, monitoring and understanding of the resource usage, usage of containers becomes more challenging. Without explicit limits, it can be harder to identify containers that may be using resources than expected. Uh, and yes, th- this is the this is the problem of you know uh, give a give a real brief example here. Let's say you're an e-commerce site, and you have Black Friday and you have Cyber Monday. Uh, those may be uh, the 
hopefully those are the largest amount of requests. And I'm sorry, when I say requests, I don't mean uh, Kubernetes requests. I mean like <laughs> user requests, right? In production that you're getting per year. Like you're getting a lot of people, hopefully hitting your application. So then if you try to sit there and forecast like, okay, this year, this was it. What uh, this was what it was. We had some performance issues. So let's forecast this for next year to say, okay, this is what we need. And then the problem with that is, you could do that, but hopefully, if your business has grown in that year, those numbers still aren't going to be valid. Like you could be up fifty percent from last year. You don't know. Um, so, so really good point made here. Yeah, and there's also just a simpler um, aspect to that too, which maybe what you're getting at. Um, if you are trying to monitor thousands or hundreds or thousands of workloads on a Kubernetes uh, cluster, um, how do you know which ones to look at to figure out if they're quote unquote you know exceeding their requests? Well, it, it turns out there are metrics that say this thing has been throttled or this container was um killed. Um, and those can be just like spotlights that take you straight to um, helping you identify which containers. Um, in the case of over-consuming, like consuming more resources than have, have, been, have been requested, those just having dedicated metrics for those kinds of events um, is one way that uh, you can sort of help help guide yourself to what to pay attention to as, as a human operator or a platform administrator. Um, that might be part of, I think, what that comment is getting at, which is absolutely true. Because if you don't, if you have thousands of workloads, like where should you look? Do you mm -hmm. want to look at every single one of them? I don't care mm -hmm. if you want to. That's not that's not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there, there are wants and needs in the world, and you know uh, that all depends on the person. But uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, you know, Reed, what you're getting at uh, also is uh, something that we actually haven't touched on yet, which maybe we should have in the beginning, but that's okay. Uh, metrics server versus cube state metrics, right? And the information that you can bring in as a whole. So for for everybody that's watching, if you're not familiar, 100. percent metric server is more about like the cluster itself like cpu and memory more higher level uh pieces of, of information and metrics from that perspective and then cube state metrics will actually dive down to the application parentheses pod level and give you everything from a cpu memory perspective of like how your application is performing and what you should be expecting and you can take all those metrics out and throw them into prometheus or wherever and then kind of get in somewhat better understanding of how your application is performing but again very manual right and like you don't know what you don't know and i think that's the biggest problem here that we see with uh limits requests is like you can't know what you don't know so you don't know right off the bat how your application is going to perform number one number two you don't know right off the bat uh, when your heavy times are going to be, you know, like if you have, let's say for example, like, let's say like for me, right? Like I'm in New Jersey. So, it, you know, maybe I'm running an e-commerce site and my, my largest, uh, you know, um, uh, consumer base is maybe in Australia, right? Which depending on time zone or uh, depending on uh, the time of the year, 12 to 14 hours ahead. So like, I could look at my application and it could be 6 p.m. by me. And I'm like, oh, you know, after business hours, let me throttle this thing down for the next 12 hours. But my biggest consumer base is in Australia. So for them, like they're just getting started with their day, right? It's, it's 9-ish a.m. by them. So then you have to like figure out that, right? And that's, I feel like we're going into the weeds, obviously. But, um, you know, it, it really all depends on like just so many factors, right? Like there's just, there's so many things that you have to figure out manually. Yeah, another, I think another thing I wanna, I'm, just as I've been turning this kind of comment over in my head, I'm also realizing too, it's worth mentioning, most organizations to, to today, um, one of two things goes wrong. Um, the application performance is impacted by improper resource management. Um, in which case, that's probably the worst thing for most organizations because you want to make sure that your business is up and running, that your services are are behaving as expected and so forth. That's most important. On the flip side, there's the IT cost. There's the, the cloud cost of running all of these workloads in Kubernetes and so forth. That's kind of the, the it's also not something they want, the people want to, uh, to overspend on, but it's not as acute as this service uh, went down. Um, and so I think organizations for the last few years have gotten has spent most of their expertise and time on making sure they have ways of knowing when um, workloads are over consuming and need to have requests increased. Um, I don't think that as many people have spent as much time on sort of the opposite or 
side of that of, okay, well, what, have, what do I have that's over provisions? Um, it's not triggering any limits. It's not hitting any performance or reliability issues. What I'm getting is, you know, like uh, Mike was saying a second ago, I'm getting calls from my CFO um, or from my FinOps group telling me like, what, where, where, where's all this money going? Can we do anything to reduce it? Um, mm -hmm. But that's not as targeted. Um, and so we've seen, I think uh, somebody once described this to me as, you know, the cloud promised elasticity. Elasticity means that we, we grow when we need it and we shrink when we don't. And it's the shrink when we don't part that's probably the, the harder problem for a lot of people in Kubernetes workloads. Because like, like kind of was inferred, you get signal when things hit limits and you can decide to raise that. Um, but most people forget to go back and lower it later if it turns out that it's no longer needed. Exactly, yep. And thinking about as a whole, how to kind of fix this, this is where we can get people excited about what we're going to be talking about on Thursday of this week, uh, which we're on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 14th, right? 14th or 15th? 14th? Yes. You, you um, yeah. tested my memory, man. Dates are not my forte. <laughs> I just have a calendar for this. Exactly. I look this I Thursday <laughs> coming up, because uh, I clearly cannot do math or count. Um, this Thursday, we're going to be talking again live and showcasing demos and such. Probably more demos on Thursday and more uh, uh, engineering focused stuff from from a, a code based perspective of how to fix this stuff from an repeatable uh, a repeatable perspective, uh, you know, or automated, whatever you want to call it. But I, I like to think about what we're going to be talking about on Thursday in a more repeatable fashion, um, which will ultimately be taking everything that we talked about today, the complexities of everything from, again, you know, the example I gave of, you know, different time zones and how do you know what's going to be performant, what's not going to be, uh, to all of Reed's examples of what if you don't hit set requests, what if you set too many, et cetera, et cetera. What if you, you know, have like we saw in the Istio uh, example where, yeah, we needed at least two gigs, but did we actually need it? So we're going to be talking about all of that from a repeatability perspective on Thursday. Uh, and same thing, we will be tuning in. Uh, we're tuning in right now on LinkedIn, YouTube, and X. Uh, we will be doing the same thing on Thursday. All right. So wrapping up here, Reed, did you have anything that you want to leave everybody with? Uh, maybe a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I know we mostly talked sort of without getting super focused, but our my my thesis after working on this for a long time is that this this is stuff that is not complicated. People can figure this out. We can talk about it. We can learn all the nuances and the specifics. I don't want to do this anymore, <laughs> um, <laughs> especially when you start talking about it at scale. And that's that's kind of what um, why you know, Mike, you were kind of um, projecting forward to the uh, the other the focus of the other um, workshops coming up is yeah we, we figured out how to do it. We know how to do it, um, but how do we not do it? How do we spend less of our time on this while still getting the benefits that we need of the the you know appropriate performance because it has proper resource allocation, but also not overspending and losing out on the cost optimization? How do we how do we not do this basically? Yep, <laughs> how do we exactly. get it but not do it? And 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 I think that's going to be uh, the the most important piece is how to not do it, uh, and that's exactly what we're going to be touching on this Thursday. So. Tune in. Uh, it's going to be a really fun one, and I'm excited about this. And we have a couple of next week as well. Uh, next week, we're going to be jumping on again on Monday and on Thursday. So definitely stay tuned for that. Thanks, Mike. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Reed, thank you so much for joining me, and we'll see you all again in a couple of days.